Thank you for coming in. Um, tonight's lecture with David Blight represents a collaboration between two venerable institutions in Atlanta. Coincidentally, both founded 87 years ago in 1926. The Lovett School, um, just down the road on Paces Ferry, was started by a progressive educator, um, Eva um, Edwards Lovett. This independent school currently serves 1,600 students in kindergarten through 12th grade, hailing from various communities throughout metropolitan Atlanta. The Atlanta History Center, which was founded as the Atlanta Historical Society, was started the same year by a group of civic-minded citizens interested in preserving the story of the growing city. And it's become one of the lar nation's largest history centers and research institutions. Our partnership between Lovett and the History Center takes many forms. Um, and as the History Center works to connect people of our various communities to each other through history and culture, Lovett works to develop young men and women of honor, faith, and wisdom through a holistic education grounded in learning, character, and community. Lovett and its headmaster, Billy Peoples, were instrumental in helping us bring slavery at Jefferson's Monticello, how the word is passed down, and there are many other of you in the audience who were very instrumental with that as well. And the institution, two institutions now are joining in their um, second year of this um, Civil War and the Forging of Character, a four-year lecture series marking the sesquicentennial of the Civil War and the Battle of Atlanta. Tonight's lecture with David Blight, Dr. Blight, is the fifth lecture in the series, and is um, brought to, which has brought to Atlanta such um, scholars as Ed Ayers from the University of Richmond and Gary Gallagher of the University of Virginia. The purpose of these lectures is to engage all of us, students, teachers, families, and the community at large on critical matters of character and integrity as demonstrated during this defining period of our nation's history. The Civil War and the forging of characters made possible by the Levitt School's Jack and Anglin Character Education Speakers Fund through the generosity of the Jan, Jack and Anglin Charitable Foundation and brothers Jack, Austin, Bob, and Lewis Glenn. Thank you for, um, for those uh, the Glenn family. <laughs> Tonight, um, Valerie Jackson, Richardson Jackson will introduce our speaker. She embodies the innovative spirit and a list of firsts for African American women. With a BS in business management from Virginia Commonwealth University, an MBA from the Wharton School of Finance and Commerce at the University of Pennsylvania, she later worked in marketing with great advertising in Transworld Airlines, both in New York City. To Atlantans, Ms. Jackson is well known as our former first lady, wife of the late Maynard, Maynard Mayor Maynard Jackson. In that role, she also served as special advisor to the Mayor's Office of Economic Development and helped to bring the 1988 National Democratic National Convention to Atlanta. <coughs> Ms. Jackson has a long tenure of service on the boards of numerous organizations throughout Atlanta. And if you're a listener of WABE, you definitely know her voice. It's a long time award-winning host of Between the Lines, a series of conversations with notable writers and thinkers such as Maya Angelou, Jimmy Carter, Cornell West, and Hillary Clinton. She's also, not coincidentally, the proud mother of two daughters, Valerie, Amanda, and Alexandra, both Lovett School graduates. Please welcome me in joining Valerie Jackson. Welcome Valerie Jackson. Thank you. Thank you and good evening. Thank you very much, Chef Bill and Headmaster Peoples. It's good to always be here in the Atlanta uh, History Center. I'm such a history buff that I, every opportunity I get to come in here, I, I try to take advantage of. But more importantly, tonight, as Chef Bill mentioned, I am a Lovett family member here. So I'm proud to be a part, even just a little part, of the speaker series. And I want to let you know that I've been listening and and checking out who's been speaking in the series, and I've been very impressed. Not surprised, not surprised, very impressed, because, you know, that's the way love it rolls. So, as the kids say, that's the way it rolls. Anyway, tonight, it's no exception, because once again, we have an outstanding speaker, historian David Blight. David is the class of 1954 Professor of American History at Yale, and that's the title of the chair, Class of 1954 Professor of American History at Yale, because he really wasn't even born in 1954. <laughs> so, he's one of the nation's foremost authorities on the Civil War and its legacy. 
Blight also serves as the director of the Gilder Learman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale. Blight's most recent book, American Oracle, The Civil War in the Civil Rights Era, looks at the ways in which Americans have reacted to the centennial celebration of the war just 50 years ago, which was very special to me because in 1963, it was a very turbulent year. My two brothers and I integrated an all-white high school in Richmond, Virginia, and um, it, was, it was not an easy road. I'll, I'll make that another evening. Um, at any rate, this, so I'm very much interested in this particular book because it does reflect what's happening uh, in terms of history reaching forward to the civil rights and now reaching forward even further. So his book looks at the ways in which Americans reacted to the celebration and the book closely examines the work of four American writers. Is this, this is the same book, right sir? Good, I want to be sure because I don't want to, it's a book that I can't wait to get a hold of and to digest. The book closely examines the work of four American writers. One, Robert Penn Warren, who's a novelist and a, actually a former segregationalist. Bruce Canton, who's a well-noted um, Civil War historian. Edmund Wilson, who is my favorite of all literary critics. And the bold and honest truth of James Baldwin's African-American experience. Black looks at how each of them explored the gulf between remembrances and reality. As we commemorate the 150th anniversary of the Civil War, and I decided I might not be able to pronounce <coughs> sesquicentennial, and I was right. So, <laughs> as we celebrate the 150 years of the Civil War, uh, David Blight, through his work, has really given us an invaluable perspective and how, on how that conflict is still continuing to shape our country's political debates, national identity, and even its sense of purpose. David Blight's previous works include A Slave No More, which combines two recently discovered slave narratives that recorded the lives of the authors, and it provided a very detailed history of their story of emancipation. Also, he wrote, Race and Reunion, the Civil War in National Memory. This received at least eight book awards, including the Bancroft Prize um, for noted historian, uh, noted books of history, and the Frederick Douglass Prize for noted books on slavery. In addition to his scholarly work, Dr. Blight serves on the boards of several museums and historical societies, including the 9-11 Memorial and Museum, and the Board for African American Programs at Monticello, which actually makes him the perfect candidate to speak here tonight in conjunction with the History Center's exhibition, <coughs> Slavery at Jefferson's Monticello. I'm personally looking forward to every word out of his mouth, and so without further ado, let's welcome David Blight. Thank you, Mrs. Jackson. Great honor. Thank you so much, Mrs. Jackson. It's a great honor to be introduced by you. Uh, thank you, Sheffield, for hosting this series. Everybody all right? Okay, good, good, good. I caught him. <laughs> she doesn't miss a beat. Uh, it's a great privilege to follow my buddies, uh, Ed Ayers and Gary Gallagher. I suspect they threw enough smoke bombs to pre prepare the space for me, especially Gary, if you were here. Uh, and thank you, Billy Peebles, and the Lovett community uh, for hosting this and inviting me. Um, it's wonderful to be back at this institution. I did a lot of research right across the lawn here. Uh, at least two or three lovely, quiet, anonymous days I spent over there in your archive when I was working on Race and Reunion. I may have, been, I may have had a second visit. I, I'm 
forgetting. Uh, I can even remember, though, one of the collections I worked in right here. Uh, you may not want to know, it was Myrtle Lockett Avery's collection. Uh, she, well, she was a, a, an apologist for the Ku Klux Klan, but she left an amazing archive. <laughs> anyway, I, I had to come find it. Um, uh, Mrs. Jackson mentioned that uh, I've been an advisor for a lot of museums, and one of those museums I'm advising with now, as it is being conceived, and it will indeed be open, in about a year is the 9-11 Museum at Ground Zero in New York. Um, I mention that because it's a wonderful feeling. Please trust me, I've the, during the sesquicentennial, those of us in the business, we just shorten it to sesqui, and you can get away with it. But during this sesqui, some of us are on the road a lot, and I'm, I've been speaking many, many, many places, but it's especially a good feeling to speak in a place like Atlanta and like the Atlanta History Center because you're a place that cares about its history. That's not the case everywhere. Um, although, um, I've had some amazing experiences. They care about their history in Minnesota, too. I mean, who would have thought? Uh, <laughs> 10 a.m. on a Saturday morning, about this kind of crowd came out for a lecture on the Civil War in St. Paul, Minnesota. The only thing happening that day was a high school hockey tournament, so maybe that, I don't know. Anyway, but, but to the 9-11 Museum, for just a brief moment, uh, last year, the New York Times invited about four or five people who in one way or another had been associated with the 9-11 Museum as advisors or something to do an online chat group, you know, where they would put it up on an online forum. It was all done ahead of time and actually edited, even though I think they tried to make it seem live. It was not live. They had us go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, debating issues. Uh, there were two of us historians, two people from the policy world, the kind of foreign policy world, and the fifth person was the brother of a victim of 9-11. But one of the questions they kept asking us to, to pursue, and it wasn't going very well at first, but the question was, what are the origins of 9-11? I mean, wh where do you go to find its origins? And we would go back and forth, and it was a little dry at first. We got back into the 90s, at least. And then we, then we got back to the uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, the Soviet-Afghan war, which is a very important predecessor of 9-11. That's where al-Qaeda came about and so forth and so on. We got that far. And, and yet the policy people, and I, I won't name any names, they, they didn't want to do any more history of that. They, they wanted to talk policies. And, and I got frustrated at one point in this process that we weren't going back any further. And I kept saying it, and they kept saying, well, now come on. And, and then the, the, common, the person moderating this thing kept prodding us and prodding us, trying to get some controversy, which is what journalists do. And so finally I said, all right, the origins of the mass slaughter of civilians? How about the Trojan War? By God, let's go back to the Trojan War. <laughs> and they said, no, 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 wait a minute. No, wait a minute, we, you know, we can't do that in a museum. But you might even have to go further to understand things like 9-11, our Civil War, and a hundred other such examples we could think of. There's this passage in James Baldwin's wonderful 1950s novel called Another Country. The James Baldwin, who's the great African-American writer of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and the Baldwin who became, in effect, the written, I mean, if, if Dr. King was the oratorical voice of the Civil Rights Movement, Baldwin was the written voice. There's this passage. It's brief, in another country where Baldwin has his principal, his protagonist, his main character, whose name is David in that novel, and I won't go into what all the context was, but David and his friends are having a, a real debate about existential issues, about life and history. And David suddenly at one point gets the attention of everyone in the room and he says, perhaps life offers only the choice of remembering the garden. And by that, he means Garden of Eden. Only remembering the garden or forgetting it. 
either or. It takes strength to remember, says David. It takes another kind of strength to forget. It takes a hero to do both. People who remember court madness through the pain of the perpetually recurring death of their own innocence. People who forget court another kind of madness, and the world is mostly divided between madmen who remember and madmen who forget. Heroes are few. I love the passage. It's complicated, but I love it because it's so typical of Baldwin. It's Baldwin's way of trying to say, you know, you can't live without remembering, but you may not be able to live without forgetting either. And the oldest memory of humankind, metaphorically, is our sin in the garden. So origins, they're deep. They're old, really old. And one of the best things you can say about history especially to young people, is that nothing is new in the world. Whatever happens to you has happened before. It's happened to somebody. In fact, Baldwin again. Baldwin gave hundreds and hundreds of interviews, especially in the last oh, decade or so of his life. He was once being interviewed by Studs Terkel, the great Studs Terkel of Chicago, who became such a great oral historian. And Baldwin was being Baldwin, this rapid fire. If you, ever, if you ever saw or heard James Baldwin speak, or you can pull him up on YouTube and watch one of his interviews, he often would answer a question before it was asked. He would just start firing away at whoever was interrogating him and just say what he thinks, especially if it was a white person he could make guilty for a while. <laughs> but he was ranting on in this interview with Turkle about how Americans don't have any sense of history. Americans don't have any sense of tragedy. And finally, Circle sort of stopped him and said, but Mr. Baldwin, what do you mean that we don't have a sense of history? And in the YouTube version, you can see Baldwin finally for a moment just kind of stop and reflect. It's like, you know, Turkle interrupted him, which he should have. And Baldwin paused and he said, well, I guess it means that whatever happens to you, how terrible it is, you realize it happened to Dostoevsky a hundred years ago. I guess what it means to have a sense of history, he says then, is that you know you're not alone. It's the best answer I've ever heard, especially for young people. Why have a sense of history? Because you won't be alone. You might even be prepared a little bit for when things happen to you. I don't know if any of you will remember this. I mean, what I want to talk about tonight is the memory of the Civil War, especially during that centennial period of the 50s and 60s, and then make some comparisons to where we may be now and how we're handling our sesquicentennial <laughs> of this event. And I want, to, I want to end particularly with my own little emerging list of why I think this event keeps its hold on us and kind of still won't let us go. But I want, I want to remember the morning after President Obama's first election. You probably don't remember this, but the morning after the first election in 08, a column in the New York Times by Tom Friedman, the famous columnist of the New York Times. This was the morning after. Maybe Tom hadn't slept much that night, don't know. But the topic sentence, the opening sentence of his editorial the next morning was, and I think I have it verbatim, last night, Grant Park, Chicago, Illinois, United States of America, 10 p.m., the American Civil War ended. I remember reading that, thinking, oh, Tom, what a dumb thing to say. <laughs> but then I also remember at least briefly thinking, oh, dear, what if he's right? That's bad for business. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, I won't have any students anymore, or I don't know, they'll, they'll fire me, or something, you know. Uh, well, of course, uh, that kind of hyperbole is understandable, I guess, given, uh, you know, Friedman was celebrating the morning after. 
48% of Americans weren't. And as we found out, whatever that civil war was that Tom Friedman was referring to had ended, hadn't ended. It hadn't. And there are lots of reasons that this event and its many, many legacies never quite end. Part of the reason is simply that history has no end. We wish it would, don't we? Why doesn't the past just go settle down somewhere and stay put? I learned it. I have it. Don't mess it up for me. Don't revise it. How many times have you heard that word used? That's revisionist history. My favorite response to every time I hear some politician, and both parties do it, Every time I hear some politicians say, oh, that's just revisionist history, I just want to grab them by the lapel and say, would you prefer your doctor wasn't a revisionist? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, well, there are many reasons why that occurs. I am still stunned that you grew up here in schools that didn't teach you much about Reconstruction. That's terrible. Uh, Kenneth Stamp once said, <laughs> great historian, he once said, well, yeah, in the Civil War, there was glory enough to go around, but after 1865, we couldn't find enough glory. Maybe, maybe. But of course, Reconstruction is all about race. It's all about the aftermath of emancipation. It's all about what did freedom mean? Who were the freed people? What would their status be? That had to be faced. But let me, let me, let me just take on very briefly your question about the separation between military history and the rest. I was telling Sheffield earlier, Oh, 10 years ago at least, I did a site visit at Kennesaw Mountain Battlefield. Is anybody here from the National Park Service at Kennesaw Mountain Battlefield? Okay. Uh, maybe I shouldn't finish this story. <laughs> it was Gary Gallagher and me and somebody else, I forget. The, the Organization of American Historians, I think we've stopped this now. We used to do these site visits, Civil War sites. We'd examine all the programming, and then we would write up a report and just make recommendations and so forth and so on. And we, we noticed that in the mandate for Kennesaw Mountain, for the site, the National Park site, originally under the War Department in the 30s, the mandate said their, their duty or obligation was to interpret the entire Atlanta campaign. So we provided to your previous colleagues all sorts of material. There's some terrific books on emancipation in Georgia on the huge refugee phenomenon that Sherman created by invading Georgia. The thousands of, of freed slaves, or they thought they were freed, who were following Sherman. For that matter, white refugees who were following Sherman, who ended up amassing around Marietta for huge amounts of time. And of course, Sherman didn't want any of them. Sherman didn't want any black people following his army at all, as you may know. The problem was that they had never considered even telling this story. And I understand that, their own training, their own background, the, you know, the idea of a park site is that it's site-specific, site and so you know all this language. But we had a devil of a time getting people to, to break out of this idea. The Atlanta campaign is about taking Atlanta, but it's also about the destruction of slavery throughout central Georgia. It's a huge story. And it's an amazing story about real people. Now, last point. What we've been doing for years now, I mean, traditional historians and in pedagogy and teaching and textbooks, is, is museum exhibitions of all kinds in South and North and West, is trying to help Americans understand the Civil War from not just many perspectives, but to realize that it, that it is a huge military event about transformative political and social issues. And if all you do is the battle campaigns without politics and without the social impact on people, then you don't even know what war is. Uh, the new museum in Richmond, uh, they still keep saying it's new, the National Civil War Center at Tredegar has made its mission, for better or worse, to tell what they say, they call all three stories. That means Confederate Union and African American. And they really are trying to tell all of those together in 
kind of ground zero of Confederate memory, Richmond. Um, and I guess this is the problem. It is, has always been the problem. It will continue to be the problem. It's why so many of us are studying the problem of public memory now, because there is such a distance sometimes. And I don't mean this to denigrate anybody, but there is a distance between the, the hundreds of books that we write, the scholarship we produce, and the way it gets into public memory or doesn't get into public memory. As John Lucaccio once warned, he said, there is far, far, I think he used three fars, far, far, far more memory than there is history. People's memories are hard to penetrate, especially about sensitive, difficult subjects. For Georgians to teach you about slavery and emancipation and reconstruction, Georgia has to face the fact of slavery at the center of its history and emancipation at the center of the results of the Civil War and race relations at the center of the meaning of reconstruction. Until they do, more people will be raised wondering, why wasn't I taught about reconstruction? And by the way, there is no national park site about reconstruction anywhere. There was almost one in Beaufort, South Carolina back in the 90s. And then the political will went away in the first eight years of this century and the budgets went away. No national historic site commemorating Reconstruction. Yes, sir. Thank you for coming tonight, Dr. White. You're welcome. Mm. And if not, how might you imagine such an event taking place or taking form? Ooh, wow. You mean if, if I had the budget and the ear of the White House and Congress and they would obey? <laughs> well, since we're going to be utopian for the moment, uh, why not? Well, look, there are plenty of events, lots of events. I've been to so many I can't count them. Uh, events with audiences this large. Whole, I was just at a conference all last weekend at Harvard. And probably had 150 people there, mostly scholars. Really good papers, all about emancipation, kind of for ourselves. Uh, we need much. I was, although just recently I was telling Sheffield, I think, I was at a big conference at, at Gettysburg. It was hosted at Gettysburg College, co-hosted by the National Park Service. It was called The Future of Civil War History. 500 people came. And it was, it was quite remarkable in that it was a three-day affair with lots of scholars, but lots of Park Service people and, and public historians of, of varying kinds. And it was not your granddaddy's Civil War anymore. Actually, I got up at one of the Q&A sessions in front of a microphone and just said that. And like half the audience applauded, and the other half didn't. But it was remarkable. We were dealing with such things as new studies of the hospitals in the Civil War, of death and disease, of the smallpox epidemic that broke out at the end of the war. I mean, a really darker underside of that war. Uh, at the same time, we were dealing with big, big questions about uh, policy and major decisions by generals and by presidents and, and so on. And I chaired a session as usual on memory, which was fascinating. And we had a lot of teachers there as well. So those kinds of things are entirely possible, and they are happening with hundreds of people coming to them. If I had my way, um, hey, I wish we'd do what John Hope Franklin, I don't, you won't probably know that, the great John Hope Franklin, the late John Hope, the, the great African-American historian, you may remember that during the Clinton years, Clinton appointed him chair of his uh, race Commission, the Commission on Race. We were going to have a national conversation on race for two years. The first year those conversations really did seem to occur in big public forums all over the country. And the second year, Bill Clinton was being impeached most of that year, and most of that fell apart. <laughs> but one of John Hope's ideas for that, that never came off, is something we ought to do now. It'd be messy, but God, it'd be fun. The idea back then was to have Bill Clinton himself, he's pretty good on his feet, 
uh, moderate, like three consecutive nights on CNN, or whatever network would do it. Uh, panels of like seven to eight people. One night you might have mostly scholars. Maybe not entirely scholars, because they might, they'll start talking about their footnotes. So you've got to have somebody to keep them honest. And next night you might have a public activist of some sort. And the third night, I don't know, psychologist and whatever. I, you know, but, you, but Clinton, the President of the United States, moderating. What does race mean in America? You'd have millions of people watching it. You'd have editorials flooding the newspapers for days on end. It'd be a messy, crazy conversation, but it'd been a hell of a conversation. We could do that with this event. One more question. Anybody wants to volunteer to be the moderator? <laughs> I'll turn your name into this fictitious panel that's going to listen to me. Sir. Thank you for an outstanding speech. I really appreciate it. I learned a lot. You know, I get more I realize how little I know and how much more I want to learn. Well, there's always time. I know. There's too much to read in the world, though. I know. You, at one point tonight, you've talked about outcomes. I remember you mentioned mm -hmm. the word outcomes. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, from your view as a historian, how critical do you think the contribution of the black soldiers and the free slaves yeah. and the black people Mm -hmm. the Civil War, or to the outcome that in the end the Union right. Army was victorious? Oh, it's a great question. It's been the heart of a lot of great scholarship the last 30 years. Uh, not only on black soldiers, but especially on the process of emancipation. It's led to this quasi-debate about, so who really freed the slaves? Was it Lincoln, the Proclamation, and the Union Army? Or was it the slaves themselves? Uh, the answer to that is essentially both. Uh, I did this little book uh, called A Slave No More, which is based on two recently discovered post-war slave narratives, autobiographies by men who escaped during the war. Both of them escaped by their own extraordinary bravery from slavery. But neither of them would have escaped if it weren't for the presence of the Union Army and, in one case, the Union Navy. One guy escapes across the Rappahannock River in April of 1862 and is freed by the officers of a New York regiment. The other guy escapes in Mobile Bay in August of 1864 and is picked up by a Union gunboat that took him to an island and saved his life. Now, the contribution, to sum it up, Lincoln summed it up. He said without the African Americans, he said this in late 64, without the African American soldiers we would not be winning this war. Of course, they're not in the Union Army to speak of until 1863, after the proclamation. It's often missed, I think, that one of the two or three things that, are, that is so stunning and new about that Emancipation Proclamation, as dull as it is as a legal document, is that it authorized the recruiting of black soldiers. In effect, it ordered the recruiting of black soldiers and it ordered the Union forces to free slaves wherever they encountered them. Now, that still had to be worked out as to how that would actually be accomplished and be done, and of course they had to win the war. Um, depending on which book you were to look at, I could show you works now that, that, that basically argue that emancipation was more the result of the pressure the slaves themselves in certain regions of the South put on the slave system and that slavery was beginning to dissolve, it was beginning to dissolve from within, especially in certain regions of the South. Particularly where Union forces occupied regions of the South, slaves fled in droves. Now, this is a sensitive debate among scholars and among a lot of people. Um, but all you need to do also, though, on the other side of that, is to read some of the, I mean, there's such a pile of recent Lincoln books. Oy. Um, but some of them are, are showing quite effectively. I just reviewed a book by Lou Major called Lincoln's Hundred Days. It's the hundred days between the preliminary and the final Emancipation Proclamation. But it's also about more than that hundred days. And there's a, a recent terrific book by James Oakes called Freedom National. And what you'll, what you'll realize in some of this scholarship now is the emancipation early on in the war, thousands and eventually millions of Yankees, Northerners, who would never have voted for emancipation, 
<laughs> before the war. But they come to see now that the war can't be won without the destruction of slavery. And the destruction of slavery is one of the principal ways that the Union won the war. And that's a combination of the force of the military, the political proclamation by Lincoln, which announces to the world that this is the purpose of the war, and the slaves themselves using their own volition and bravery. I and mean, it's amazing when you get inside the records on this. <laughs> The, the way people just came against all odds to get to a contraband camp. And we now, have, and, they're not, and there's now, we just, we sponsored a conference at Yale, my center does a conference every year. The, year, the conference we did a year and a half ago, uh, two years ago, was on new scholarship about emancipation. And we've got a, a whole slew of people now studying the contraband camps. There were about 25 of these huge refugee centers that cropped up around the rim of the South where freed slaves escaped to, and they were eventually formally run by the Union Army, and they kept some decent records. We now know that, uh, especially in the lower Mississippi Valley, and those very dense <coughs> slave populations of that region, and to some extent other places, about one of every four uh, slaves who managed to get to a contraband camp died in the process. So even the process of gaining freedom is a deadly process, just like the war is a deadly process. Um, <laughs> there was a contraband camp in Corinth, Mississippi. I got to know that one fairly well because one of my guys in this book, A Slave No More, kept trying to get there. He didn't escape until his fifth attempt. And his first four attempts were, were up. He was, he was in Pickensville, Alabama, and he kept trying to go north along the Ohio and Mobile Railroad line to get to Corinth, because he, he knew there was a big contraband camp there and it was a Union garrison town. That contraband camp at one point had between eight and 10,000 freed slaves living in it. They built cabins, they built little streets, they named the streets for Union generals. And they even formed a Union regiment within the camp in 1863. It was called the First Alabama Volunteers of the Union Army, because they were almost all from Alabama. They were the first Alabama, and they were all black. They eventually ended up uh, not with Sherman's army, because he wouldn't have them. They ended up uh, at, at Chattanooga, uh, and I forget, I lost track of them after that. But the stories within the story of emancipation blow your mind when you finally get down on the ground and look at them. I guess the answer to your question is, a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, did you have a question too? I, I don't know if we have time. We don't have time. Uh, <laughs> but, but you can Sorry. Him while you're that's, you're the the book. that's the K Kennesaw Mountain rejoinder, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, please, um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thanks. I can't wait to see your What's that? I can't wait to see your, uh, your editor. I mean, your, oh, the uh, review of Gelzo. It's quite a book, but it, oh boy, he 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 never met a detail he didn't fall in love with. I'll tell you. <laughs> Alchemy, maybe. You know. <laughs> Robert Penn Warren, the great Southern writer, author of so many wonderful books, All the King's Men, a book I think you should have to read to have U.S. citizenship. That's just my opinion. Uh, but also of that wonderful little 100-page essay called Legacy of the Civil War that he published in 1961 at the Centennial. Still, I think the, you're going to start with a single text somewhere on this problem of the legacies and memory of the Civil War. Red Warren's Legacy of the Civil War, 1961, is a place to start. Among the many, many quotable lines in that book is the one where Warren said, the Civil War draws us as an oracle, darkly unriddled and portentous, of personal as well as national fate. Now, that's a mouthful. Our oracle draws us personal 
and national fate. Now, you could get up a fight over this in an argument, you know, among the history-minded people, which all of you are, about, you know, which event in our past, which part of our past, which force in our past, which moment in our past is our oracle we go to to know who we are. If by oracle we mean, in the Greek sense, the place one goes to ask questions, to get wisdom, to find answers, especially to those answers of, so who are we? Warren had a point. But if the Civil War is our oracle somehow, as a people, where is that oracle? Where is your oracle? Is it Cemetery Ridge at Gettysburg? If, 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 it, is, if it is a physical place, Cemetery Ridge, the, the ridge in the Gettysburg battlefield, visited by more than two million people a year. A place people go to commune to try to understand how, how could this happen or what happened at the climax of Pickett's charge. Is it Stone Mountain outside of Atlanta? The South's attempt in the early 20th century at a Confederate Mount Rushmore. It was intended probably to be some kind of great physical oracle, some sort. Now I, I hear it's mostly an amusement park with light shows and I don't know, lots, I'm sure lots of fun goes on there. Or is the Oracle Monument Avenue in Richmond? It certainly was for Douglas Southall Freeman, the great Lee biographer and author of Lee's Lieutenants who was also the editor of a Richmond newspaper, we're told that the, the great Douglas Southall Freeman, historian, journalist, used to live right up off Monument Avenue. Some of you, I'm sure, know this story. And every day he would walk to work and walk right by the, the Lee Equestrian statue and stand there and salute it. Apparently that monument was his oracle. Or is it the Shaw Memorial in Boston? Augustus St. Gordon's masterpiece the masterpiece of American public art, in my humble, useless opinion. That's St. Gordon's famous bas-relief of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment, the Black Regiment, organized in Massachusetts with its commander, Robert Gould Shaw, on his horse. Uh, that magnificent monument that you can almost feel the bayonets moving in it. You can almost feel the bodies of those black soldiers moving. You can see the 22 different black men's faces and boys' faces that he actually modeled for that monument. Especially since the movie Glory, that place has become a kind of oracle for some people. I've taken lots of student groups and teacher groups in the summer to that site and I stand up on the platform and in front of the godforsaken noise of all those buses on Beacon Street in Boston. You, you have to scream your story, you know, it makes you belt it out. Or is the oracle about the Civil War somewhere in language for some of us? Is it in a passage or two of, uh, of a Lincoln speech? Or a Whitman poem? Or a Martin Luther King speech? Or is our oracle really the Lincoln Memorial itself? That secular temple of the United States? that temple that's been used since 1922 by everybody, by every end of the political spectrum. Everybody appropriates the Lincoln Memorial at some point for their cause. Have you ever been in Washington on a, on a hot spring or early summer day and you just go up to visit the Lincoln Memorial and it's just full of busloads of seventh graders? <laughs> Nothing against seventh graders or foreign tourists. I was there once, probably on a research trip, I don't know, and I went for a run on the mall, and it was hot, and I'm sweating like a pig, and I walked, but by God, I, was, I walked up in the memorial, it was jammed with kids and people and foreign tours. There was the French interpreter interpreting that part of the Gettysburg Address, and there was a Russian interpreter and some other interpreter, and the kids were all screaming. And I remember the impulse, I didn't do it, but my impulse was to just shout, shut up! You know, and then I was going to give a mini lecture on the meaning of the third paragraph <laughs> of the second inaugural, right there. See? There's the meaning of the Civil War, right there. Now, get on your bus. <laughs>
It could be anywhere, this oracle. It may be mostly in the imagination. Hard to take, hard to say, hard to tell. Now, speaking of Lincoln Memorial, go with me to a place in a moment, 1963, uh, that everybody knows. Uh, one of the interesting things about this event, of course, is that even among young people, even the youngest people, somehow everybody knows this event or knows at least two or three lines from it. August 28th, 1963, steps of the Lincoln Memorial. It's, of course, the March on Washington. And it's Martin Luther King who comes to the microphone as the 11th formal speaker of the day, I believe it was. Everyone knows this speech, of course, and always will as the I Have a Dream speech. But the dream metaphor doesn't come until the last three minutes of the speech, as I'm sure some of you know. That's a 17-minute speech. Again, two clicks, pull it up on YouTube. The first 14 minutes don't employ a dream metaphor. They employ other kinds of metaphors. Here's the opening paragraph of the I Have a Dream speech. Five score years ago, gee, what's he drawing off there? <laughs> you know the Gettysburg Address. In whose symbolic shadow we stand today, uh, I'm sorry, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. One, but 100 years later, and this is the first refrain of the speech, he uses it four times in the first paragraph, 100 years later, the Negro is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on an island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself an exile in his own land. That's paragraph one. Gee, what's the speech about? It's the centennial of the Civil War and Emancipation. The I Have a Dream speech is the greatest Civil War centennial speech ever delivered. It's never going to be remembered that way. I mean, try to get the name of the I Have a Dream speech changed in textbooks or forget it. I haven't come up with a phrase yet. But. And then, of course, in the next paragraph, King employs other wonderful metaphors. He, he talks about the promissory note. And by that, he's referring to the Declaration of Independence that he says has come back labeled insufficient funds in the bank of American justice. And then the metaphors just keep raining down in the next paragraphs. For 14 minutes, no one could have mistaken what King was there to do. He was there to remind Americans and the world that this was the 100th anniversary of freedom and emancipation. And black folk aren't free. The last three minutes is where he extemporaneously, although he had prepared that dream metaphor and plenty of other speeches before, it's not like he just magically thought, oh, now I'll talk about the dream. Uh, it's only in the last few minutes that the dream speech is the dream speech. Now, just for a few minutes, I want to tell you, though, that there's a backstory to the I Have a Dream speech. There's a backstory to that whole moment that I didn't even know until doing research for this recent book, and especially from the work of one of my senior thesis students at Yale, who last year took the two or three paragraphs I had on this in my introduction, and she went with it. There, there, occasionally, you get the chance to teach a student like this who just goes with an idea, and did she ever. Here's the backstory. It turns out, King and SCLC and his lawyers have been lobbying the Kennedy White House since 48 hours after John Kennedy was inaugurated to issue a second Emancipation Proclamation by that very label. 
from day one or day two of the Kennedy presidency. And they got the idea from Kennedy himself. In the first Nixon-Kennedy debate, there might even be some folks in the room who remember that debate. I don't remember this line by any means. I was just a kid, but all I remember of those debates was Nixon sweated and Kennedy looked cool with his hand in his pocket. I mean, that's about all I remember. Just maybe all we remember from any debates anymore. But anyway, in the first Kennedy-Nixon debate, October 7, 1960, Kennedy started ranting on the Eisenhower administration, of course, Nixon had been his vice president, uh, for their failure to act on civil rights. Among the things Kennedy said was, quote, in that first debate, what will be the leadership of the president in these areas to provide equality of opportunity for employment, equality of opportunity in the field of housing, which could be done in all federal supported housing by the stroke of the president's now, when King and his aides heard Kennedy use that phrase, stroke of the president's pen, they never let him forget it. And Kennedy and a few of his aides will live to regret that he actually said that phrase. Whenever you hear a president use the term stroke of the president's pen, it means they're thinking about talking about executive orders. President Obama used the same phrase right after the Newtown shootings. And he did issue some modest executive orders. Uh, but what happened next, after the debates, and then after Kennedy was elected, King and SCLC began to lobby the White House. They had a few allies in the White House. They started lobbying the White House winter 1961. So follow my chronology here. This is gonna go on for two and a half years before the March on Washington before the I Have a Dream speech. They had a few allies, namely Harris Wofford, who was one of the president's attorneys. He was kind of the civil rights lawyer within the White House, or one of them. Harris Wofford, you may remember, was a US, he's a, a Mississippi-born Southern man, but got involved in civil rights, to say the least. And he was a White House lawyer for civil rights. Wofford, and we now have seen the internal memos in the Kennedy Library in Boston, Wofford himself lobbied President Kennedy to consider executive orders on segregated housing, segregated employment, and even the possibility of an all-out executive order second emancipation proclamation. Wofford thought it was a good idea. Uh, they also had an ally to some extent in Arthur Schlesinger Jr. Schlesinger Jr., of course, was the White House historian uh, who took his time off from Harvard and went to the White House and was the White House historian. He was a little more modest in his memos, but he too kind of prodded Kennedy now and then to think about this, think about this. Um, and th there are many, many details I'll leave out of this story or I would talk about nothing else tonight. Um, Kennedy and King finally first meet in the fall of 1961 at the White House. Actually, they had met briefly earlier uh, during the campaign, but they didn't really have much of a conversation. King gets invited to the White House fall of 1961, and President Kennedy gave him a personal tour of the White House, and they're in the Lincoln Room. They're standing in front of one of the three original drafts of the Emancipation Proclamation, and according to King's testimony, he suggested to the president that he, he should issue a second Emancipation Proclamation. And according to King, Kennedy said, that's an interesting idea. Why don't you draft something and send it to us? <laughs> so they did. And between the fall of 61 and the spring of 62, King's lawyers, uh, namely uh, an African-American attorney, oh, there were several who worked on this, an African-American attorney named Clarence Jones, who's still alive, he lives in Stanford. We, I talked to him on the phone, at least in his late 80s now. Uh, they worked all through that winter on a brief. In fact, it, what it really is is a legal brief. And in the spring, and I'm leaving out a lot of things here, King in other public appearances and in speeches starts using the expl explicit language of a Second Emancipation Proclamation, would suggest to the press whenever he got a chance that President Kennedy ought to think about this. And now if you think about it, and you know your history at all, 
Why are the leaders of the civil rights movement suggesting executive orders here? Not only because it's happened before, but because the Southern Democrats still have a hold on Congress. They don't believe anything's ever going to come from Congress. I mean, they're wrong about that. They're going to be wrong about that because we're going to eventually get the 64 and 65 Civil Rights Acts, but they don't know that yet. They think their best hope from the federal government is executive order on some level. May 17, 1962, spring of 62, just about well, 51 years ago, <laughs> King held a very public news conference at a hotel in Washington, D.C., and he held in his hand a 65, I have a copy of it right here, a 65-page document that is mostly a legal brief. It's a historical and legal brief piling up one precedent after another from court cases, from executive orders of all kinds, from legislation in American history, um, arguing that the president has the authority to issue such a second proclamation. The first four three or four pages of the document is a preamble. And the document, by the way, lists Martin Luther King is the sole author. Now, that's not true. His lawyers wrote, the, wrote those 60 pages of, of the legal brief. But the preamble could easily be King's voice. Uh, it reads like King. And in it, he quoted about every kind of egalitarian tradition in American history you could think of. He quotes the Declaration of Independence. Of course, he quotes Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. He quoted Frederick Douglass's Life and Times at length. Douglas's third autobiography. He quoted Woody Guthrie, the song, This Land is Your Land. He went to popular culture. He drew off that. He quoted, of course, from uh, John Kennedy's book called Strategy for Peace, which was this manifesto written for him by Ted Sorensen about the Cold War and the U.S. as a beacon of light and freedom and liberty to the world. Got to quote Kennedy here. This is an appeal to Kennedy. And on and on and on. He quoted Albin Tourget, who was the former Civil War veteran and author of the legal brief in Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896. Uh, and I'm leaving other things out. But it's, it's, this, it's this moral appeal to the president to do it. Be, be Lincoln a second time. And they walked over to the White House. They delivered a copy to the White House. And they said, Mr. President, <laughs> this was chutzpah. They gave him 60 days to respond. <laughs> Now, the White House had a problem by this point. If you know your history of the Civil Rights Movement in 1962, things are bloody in the South. They're incredibly turbulent in the South. Uh, James Meredith, by the way, first applied for admission to Ole Miss only a day or two after Kennedy was inaugurated. He was still applying to Ole Miss for admission in 1962. And the blow up at Ole Miss is going to occur in the fall of 62. Uh, the Kennedy White House, by this point in time, is trying to keep, you know, just keep King and SCLC at some distance if they can. They've got to deal with all these Southern Democrats who run all these committees in Congress. And, oh God, by late summer, they also, we now know, they're also getting the beginnings of news about warheads and missiles in Cuba. But they've also got another problem. They got a big anniversary coming up in September. Now, what are they going to do with that 100th anniversary of the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation? There has to be some event at the Lincoln Memorial, after all. And at first, it was decided, well, probably they have to let the US Civil War Centennial Commission plan it. But they'd not had a good record. In fact, they'd made a mess of the centennial by the first big event in Charleston to commemorate Fort Sumter being segregated, which led President Kennedy to fire the leadership of the US Centennial Commission. I'm leaving out a lot of the juicy details there. Kennedy had the good sense to appoint uh, Alan Nevins, a great historian, and to be the new head of the Centennial Commission. And Nevins had the good sense to hire uh, uh, Bud uh, Bud Robertson, excuse me, yes, oh, wonderful, wonderful old Bud. Uh, James Robertson, who then was like a 34-year-old, green behind the ears, young historian, with a great Southern accent who could go all over the South and try to deal with all those Southern state centennial commissions who were doing nothing but 100% Confederate commemoration. 
And they were doing some good work, getting somewhere. But it was decided that summer, no. You can't have the Centennial Commission plan the commemoration of the Emancipation Proclamation because the entire South would boycott it. And that's absolutely what they did. They gave the authority to create this Centennial of Emancipation to the U.S. Civil Rights Commission. So the U.S. Civil Rights Commission plans it September 22nd, anniversary of the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. Well, it was first announced that President Kennedy would speak. Kennedy's going to speak at the Lincoln Memorial on the 100th anniversary of Lincoln's Preliminary Proclamation. In SCLC and among civil rights leadership, they're beginning to think, my God, he might do it. What's he going to do? What's he going to announce? And then about two weeks before the event, we don't know precisely why, but you can guess. It was announced that the president had a scheduling conflict, and he had to cancel. And the truth is, on September 22nd, uh, he went to the America's Cup yacht race off Nantucket. <laughs> yeah. And so now you have to have a new keynote speaker. So who's that going to be? Adlai Stevenson. Why not? Adlai's from Illinois. He knows Lincoln. He's U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. Democratic Party standard bearer in 1950. Everybody knows Adlai. So Adlai Stevenson is to be the keynote speaker. It hadn't occurred to them to ask any African-American leader to appear on the platform. At the last minute, they did indeed finally get uh, Ulysses K., a young African-American composer, to compose an original piece of music, and he did. It was entitled Freedom. And uh, even more last minute, they got an appeals court attorney named Thurgood Marshall to appear and say a few remarks. And Mahalia Jackson, of course, to be there at the end to sing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. It had about 4,000 people in the audience, which is a pretty big crowd, but not a big one for the Lincoln Memorial. The event came off fine. Uh, there was a tape 10-minute speech, an audio tape played from President Kennedy. Adlai Stevenson gave a remarkable speech all about the Cold War. Now, that's not hard to understand if you think back into that moment. Adlai's speech is all about, it, it sort of mentions emancipation. It doesn't talk at all about the Jim Crow system in the 100 years since. It talked about the United States as a beacon of hope, liberty, and, and freedom to, to the world. And the event came off without too many incidents, although it was entirely boycotted by Southern State Centennial Commissions and by most Southern members of Congress. By the way, I just recently learned about a month ago from Ted Widmer's new book. Ted Widmer, I don't know if you know Ted, he was a, he was a, a Clinton White House speechwriter. He's, he's a historian. And Ted put a new book out, maybe it's three months ago now, of Kennedy tapes. You know, John Kennedy was keeping tapes in the Oval Office long before Nixon made it a famous practice. And in the, this new book of Kennedy tapes, I looked it up. John Kennedy on the morning, early morning of September 22nd, 1962, made his first of 11 phone calls to Ross Barnett in Mississippi. Must be just before he got on the plane to fly up to Nantucket to go to the America's Cup yacht race. It's his first telephone conversation with Ross Barnett, trying to get Barnett to keep the lid on Ole Miss. Trying to convince him to admit James Meredith. We don't, I don't want to move the National Guard in there. Please, Governor, you got to help us. And you know, Barnett is trying to finesse it. They will have 10 more such conversations before that terrible process will finally admit James Meredith. Now, we also know this. Uh, the White House knows a lot about missiles in Cuba. It's not like they didn't have anything else to do at that point. But also, less than two weeks after the culmination of the Cuban Missile Crisis, President Kennedy did issue an executive order outlawing segregation in federal housing. An executive order, not an Emancipation Proclamation about all forms of segregation, but an executive order in November 1962. 
it's an interesting backstory. It shows us that, oh my goodness, when we hear a great speech like the I Have a Dream speech, there's a huge history behind that. And at that point, uh, I suspect King and his aides knew they weren't going to get such an Emancipation Proclamation, but they were still hoping for certain kinds of executive orders. Although at that point, the March on Washington, of course, was a lobbying effort now on Congress. Well, let me bring this to the present moment and just suggest, and I mean these as suggestions. I think history should mostly teach us humility and not hubris. I don't have this all figured out. These are just my own list of the reasons, I think, why the Civil War and the Civil War period and its myriad legacies still has a hold on us. Here, Minnesota, or believe it or not, I gave a keynote address at the Northwest States Annual History Conference. It was in Tacoma, Washington last fall. Their subject, their theme this year was the Civil War in the Northwest. And I thought, what are they going to cover? <laughs> But it was amazing. There are whole towns in Oregon and Washington, you may know this, there are whole towns in, in um, Oregon and Washington that were settled either by former Unionists or former Confederates. And there were all these talks and papers about how, oh yeah, yeah, on that side of town you couldn't talk to people if they weren't from, you know. And so there's this whole history of the Civil War's aftermath that played out in the North. What did I know? You know. Why does the Civil War still have a hold on us? First. I would suggest it's in part because of demographics. And a lot of you in this audience know this. We're in the South here. It's, it, when I first heard this statistic go, oh, I don't know, three or four years ago, I wasn't sure to believe it. But it is true that one third of Americans, one of every three of us, which means about 100 million of us, can trace our ancestry directly to someone in the Civil War or who lived through it. <laughs> white and black. This is all Americans now, not just, you know, because great-great-granddad was a Confederate veteran or great-great-granddad was a Union veteran. One third of us can still trace our ancestry to somebody. It's still a family affair. And it's still a family affair in some parts of the country more than others. You don't need me to tell you that in Atlanta. And you know, I, I think I didn't fully, fully grasp this idea of the family affair about the memory of the Civil War until I was doing my Bruce Catton research. Bruce Catton is one of the authors in this new book. All right, show of hands. I know I've got a certain demographic here. How many of you grew up reading at least one Bruce Catton book? Yes. Catton had a way of garnering southern audiences, northern audiences, western audiences, and everybody in between. He had a way of planting the flag in the border states. He got a lot of letters from Southerners saying, I wanted to hate you, you Yankee historian, but God, you write well. <laughs> Catton, as some of you know, wrote 15 books in 22 years, be became by far, he has no other rival, the most widely read popular narrative historian of this event ever, and the editor of American Heritage Magazine, and the meal ticket of Doubleday Publishing by the late 1950s. Complicated, fascinating man who grew up in a small town, really small town in the upper part of the lower peninsula of Michigan, my home state. But in his papers, which, which no one has ever used, uh, the essay, long essay I do on Catton here is basically the first thing ever written on Catton. Largely because most of us academic, traditional historians have loved to dismiss him. You know, he's popular and we hate that. We like to dislike Shelby Foote for the same reason. Shelby came along a decade and two after Catton, but you know, too popular. Catton was a magnificent writer, an extraordinary researcher, although he had a full-time paid research assistant for six years. That didn't hurt. But in his voluminous papers, because he was such a popular author, there are thousands of fan letters. And they're a gold mine. You know, if you're trying to understand the texture of that moment. Catton gets letters, especially in the 50s. They'll write to him and say, oh, Mr. Catton, I love your book, Stillness at Appomattox. I, re I read your book slowly because I don't want them to end and yada, yada, yada. When's the next one coming out? And then the person will say, 
And on page 92, where you quote that diary from that soldier in the 31st New York Volunteers, that's my grandfather. Or once in a while, it'll say, that was my father. If you do the math, that's still possible in the 50s, certainly for grandfathers. My favorite one, though, and I quote it in the book, is the guy who writes to him, and even if he made it up, it's a, I love the story. He says, Mr. Captain, love your books, blah, blah, blah. I had nine great uncles in the Civil War, four on the southern side, five on the northern side, and you only quoted two of them. <laughs> and the letter ends with something like, well, you, you should know that they too wrote these letters. And... So it's still a family thing. And that's where most memory begins. Memory is local. If all politics is local, memory is local. At least it's where it begins. Secondly, I think we're drawn to this event. We can't help it if we're serious because of its scale of loss. Loss. Americans have never experienced death and suffering and destruction and loss in war as we did in the Civil War. Never. We lost 400,000 Americans in World War II. Horrifying. <laughs> a mere drop in the bucket, of course, to the numbers of Russians and numbers of Germans and numbers of Brits and so forth and so on, Japanese, who died in that ghastly war. And you may know that just in the past year, some of you who are serious Civil War historians here know this, the essay by David Hacker, which has been out barely a year, I think, year and a half maybe, in Civil War history, the journal, David Hacker is a, I keep calling him young, I, uh, I met him, he's young, he's young. He's a young uh, statistical historian uh, who, by a complicated set of methods, went in and studied the census of 1850, 1860, 1870, and a whole variety of other records, and using um, you know, new technologies, has come up with an analysis that says our official count of the Civil War dead is low, in fact, badly low. The official count of Civil War dead, if you just go look it up, is about 620, 625,000 Americans, about 1.2 million wounded. Hacker's analysis says that we're at, that, that number is at least 100,000 low. That the total dead in the Civil War is more like 700 to 750,000. Now take that number per capita from the four years of the Civil War, move it ahead to the Vietnam War era of 12 years per capita, we would have lost more than four million in Vietnam. That's the comparable kind of social impact. Imagine the Vietnam Memorial in Washington with four million <coughs> names on it. That's the scale of loss to the Civil War generation. And of course that loss is even greater in certain sections of the South. We're drawn to loss because it has to be explained. It has to be faced. We can't forever wash it away. Or as Whitman said in Specimen Days, the dead, the dead, the dead, the dead, our dead, ours all, north or south. And right after that famous passage, he then goes on to try to imagine how the country will redeem all that death. And loss is, of course, if you just think about it, it's one of the greatest sources of literature. Some of the greatest epic poems, some of the greatest novels are essentially about loss. The third, I think we're drawn to this event, if we're honest about it, because a lot of us love epic history, epic history. That can have many definitions, but essentially it means histories with beginnings, middles, and ends, and heroes, and villains, and just enough melodrama. And outcomes, got to have outcomes in an epic. And if the American Civil War isn't an epic, or, or if we haven't imposed an epic framework on it, then I don't know what can be. If one of the few fledgling republics on earth 
falls into a terrible situation about 80 some years into its existence, tears itself to pieces over the largest system of human slavery on the planet next to only Russian serfdom, destroys that first republic and has to rebuild the second one out of all that bloodshed, that's interesting. And it always will be. And it has a certain epic quality. I'm not saying that's good, and sometimes we impose a certain epic quality. You, you all know Ken Burns, the great filmmaker of, of many, many films, many, many important films, and for this audience especially, that great Civil War series. Ken got into the habit of, of even calling himself Homer with a camera. I remember thinking, oh, Ken, <laughs> you know, we don't entirely know who Homer was, but it's like, it's like comparing yourself to Jesus or something. You know? like, no, 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 don't go there. You're Homer with a camera? Oh, dear. But Ken Burns knew, knew the form of epic, didn't he? If you watched that film series. And boy, did Bruce Catton know it. I'm just going to read one short paragraph of Bruce Catton's prose. Just one tiny example. You can dip into almost any Bruce Catton book and find this. But this is from Terrible Swift Sword, 1963. Catton's book on the year 1862, and especially the Antietam campaign, Lee's first invasion of the North, which ends at Antietam, and the Emancipation Proclamation after. This is just Catton trying to capture in a single paragraph what's happening. Quote, there was nobility in the idea that there ought to be a peace without victory. Yet in August of 1862, America's tragedy was that it was caught between the madness of going on with the war and the human impossibility of ever stopping it. Neither Mr. Lincoln nor Mr. Davis was going to assume anything of the kind. Each man was fighting for a dreadful simplicity. Neither one could describe a solution acceptable to him without describing something wholly unacceptable to the other. Neither man could accept anything but complete victory without admitting complete defeat. Both sides had heard the trumpet that could never call retreat. The peacemakers could not be heard until the terrible swift sword had been sheathed, but the scabbard had been thrown away, and now the Confederacy was carrying the war into the enemy's territory. Catton's the only author I know who would actually use three times language from the Battle Hymn of the Republic in his own prose and get away with it. <laughs> I mean, the audacity. Four, admit it for some. We're still drawn to this in some cases because for some people there's the sheer pleasure, almost mathematical pleasure of military history. Battlefields can be mental as well as real. That may be unfortunate because when one's on a real one, the mental one may be <laughs> dead forever. But there's a lot to be said about this. Roger Angel, the great writer in The New Yorker, uh, who used to write about, among other things, he used to write about baseball. He used to say the real baseball fan has an interior stadium. I understand that. I'm a crazy baseball fan, Detroit Tigers fan. And I, th yeah, go Tigers. <laughs> but. The real military historian may also have an interior battlefield in the mind. Now, and I'm not saying this is criticism. I understand that. I actually just reviewed, I just sent it off yesterday uh, for the New York Times, a review of uh, Ellen Gelzo's new book called Gettysburg, The Last Invasion. I'm not a real military historian. I don't even claim to, I wouldn't even belong on the edges of it sometimes but I know something about it, and I just read this 500-page tome on the three days of the Battle of Gettysburg, and God, I, I struggled with it. I struggled with it. It's part realism and part romance, and I can't quite figure out which part Galzo really wants to come out on. But you can read my review in a few weeks, and then I'm going into hiding. <laughs> Five. How many times have you heard 
Why does the Civil War draw us? How many times have you heard that somehow a modern America came out of the Civil War? Our modernity began then. Our modern centralized government began then. Our modern transcontinental railroads began then. Our modern this and our modern, modern weaponry, modern war. Now, you can get up quite a debate among historians about just what's modern, about this aspect and that aspect, or not about that. But there's really something to this, especially if you're interested in understanding where the modern central federal state was born. Big government, which is now an epithet, and no one uses that phrase anymore unless they're on the defensive or attacking somebody. Big government was created by the original Republican administration, the Lincoln administration, to win the Civil War. And God, did they make it big. They didn't entirely intend to. They did in part intend to. They were, they were perfectly prepared for it. They had all cut their teeth on those political economists of the early 19th century, like Matthew Carey and, and Daniel Raymond, who believed in this idea of government as an engine of social change. But what did those original Republicans do during the Civil War? Look at what they did. Almost all of which was for the purpose of winning a civil war, with the possible exception of the Homestead Act and the Transcontinental Railroad. They created the Transcontinental Railroad, possibly the single most corrupt arrangement between private enterprise and federal <laughs> government ever imagined. But they did it with public money, the Homestead Act, which made it possible for thousands upon thousands of people to go west, take a piece of land, make it your own, and it is your own. That dream of free soilers. It created the Morrill Act, the Land Grant College Act. The idea that the federal government was going to invent colleges out across the landscape, first to train farmers, and then mechanics, and then a lot of other people. I went to the original Land Grant College, Michigan State. Now, there are three or four others that claim to be the original, too, but we were first. <laughs> I, I really have no idea. Was, they were all carried in the same year, so who cares, right? MAC is what it still says up on the, the, the giant smokestack at Michigan State, my alma mater, Michigan Agricultural College. It was one of the original land-grant colleges. So was Cornell. They created the first income tax. We love to hate income taxes. But in 1862, the federal government created an income tax and an incredibly successful federal financing system that won the Civil War. They sold U.S. bonds. They brought in Jay Gould from Wall Street and said, uh, can you help us finance this war? Because this government has never had a budget. We've never done anything like this. In fact, the only thing we've ever really run is a little bitty Navy and a big post office. Gould said, hmm, yeah. I'm gonna make my, a lot of my friends really rich, but we, we can do this. And they did. One of the greatest successes, it's not, it's not as sexy as a military campaign, one of the greatest successes of the Lincoln administration and the Union government in the Civil War was financing it. And by the way, you'd love the rates. Oh, would you love the rates. Now, they had a graduated tax. I mean, the, 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 the poorest people paid 2%, then it went up to 4%. The highest rate was 8 or 10%, and you had to make more than $10,000 a year You'd love the rates, trust me. And on and on. And then possibly the biggest act of big government ever, the largest single confiscation of property in American history. And there's never going to be another one I would venture. I mean, historians should never predict, but there's one prediction I would make. There's never going to be another confiscation of private property on the scale of the Emancipation Proclamation. The four million American slaves in 1860 were worth almost four billion dollars. That's somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 85 billion dollars today. In a period of two years, that property was eliminated without compensation by the government in order to win the Civil War. That's modernity. That's a modern centralized government, love it or hate it. Some people call it the Yankee Leviathan because they think it's a good thing, and some people call it the Yankee Leviathan because they think it was a horrible thing. But a lot of times when I hear people complaining about big government in, the, in just the, the generalized, symbolic, 
loose, generic way, I really want to sit them down and ask them, would you prefer to lose the Civil War? How about World War II? Oh, and I left out the biggest one of all. The federal government created a whole new pre-war inconceivable institution. It was called the Quartermaster Corps. The Quartermaster Corps, by 1864, was the second largest employer in the entire United States. The largest employer was the Union Army. The second largest employer was the Quartermaster Corps. They employed slightly more than 100,000 people. This was the agency set up by the federal government to arrange all the contracts with private enterprise. And yes, there was corruption, but my God, did they produce. If you still believe the reason the North won the Civil War was because of all that Yankee industrialization, there's a point. I sometimes tell my students flippantly at Yale that the Civil War was won right there in New Haven in the Connecticut River Valley because of all those gun factories <laughs> and all the clothing factories up in Massachusetts, and there's something to that. But that Quartermaster Corps was a huge success overnight, inventing this government-private enterprise relationship to fight an all-out war, the scale of which had never been even conceived before. It's our template to understand where big government came from, why it happens. And next, I think we're drawn to this event, and this may seem odd because it may contradict what I just said a couple numbers earlier. I think we're also drawn to this event because we love its ultimate story of unity. We love those images, some of us, of those blue-gray reunions, of the getting back together, the story of reconciliation. When a, when a country can have a war like that and a bloodletting like that and somehow repair itself some way, even if the cost of that repairing are terrible for some people, like the freed slaves. But nevertheless, there's a fascination with that. Look around the world. I mean, the world is riddled with places and cultures and peoples and nations yearning and begging for some kind of reconciliation from their civil wars. We did have a reconciliation. It had huge costs. I wrote a whole book about it. But we're drawn to this story because it happened. How did North and South finally reunify? How did that reunion come about? We are fascinated about the fact that we are the people who destroyed ourselves in some ways in order to reinvent ourselves. That's interesting. It'll always be interesting. And next, and not least, we're drawn to this event especially in the last 50 years, since that centennial up to now, with the revolution in the study of African American history, with the revelations of the Civil Rights Revolution, we now realize that the Civil War is America's first racial reckoning. It's the first time, not the last, that we had to face ourselves, that we had to face our racism, that we had to face slavery, that we had to face our racial divisions, and we had to do something about it. We didn't do very well at first. You're not doing well when you kill 700,000 people in a civil war. That's in some ways a terrible failure. But we're drawn to this because we now realize that if we want to understand race in this country, which is so defining of who we are, so defining of our, of our history, we better go back there to begin to understand it. Why in the world were we calling the civil rights movement the second reconstruction? Well, gee, there must have been a first. What was the first one about? Why do you have to have a second? Why do people talk about having a third? And linked to that, we're now drawn to this event uh, because of the explosion in scholarship and in teaching and in pedagogy and in textbooks and in filmmaking, in documentary filmmaking. And we got a lot of victories still to win when it comes to this <laughs> effort to affect public memory. But if you pick up almost any book on the American Civil War now, it probably has some kind of framing language. Depends on what the topic is, but many of them will have some kind of framing language saying, 
that the Civil War is the death of the first American Republic and somehow the birth of the second. You know, if the French are on their, what are they on, their fifth or sixth republic? I've lost track. <laughs> Seventh? I don't know. French have had a lot of different republics. Well, we've had at least two. And actually, we're probably living our third. The civil rights movement is the birth of, is, is, is the creation of a third. That second American republic is born in the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, and the first Civil Rights Act of 1866. It's one of the reasons the recent Lincoln movie was so valuable. Yes, I have a few problems with it as a historian, as any historian would. We like to fuss about facts and details. And Al Spielberg played fast and free with some things in that film, but so what? The whole country got a lesson about the 13th Amendment and most Americans didn't even know what it was. So that's for the good. And now last but not least, why are we drawn to this? Because a lot of us are aware, I think, or we ought to be aware. I mean, if, and if you're looking for a living, roiling, visible, steaming legacy of the American Civil War, just look at our political culture. Just look at our roiling debate about the nature of government and federalism. What do governments owe their people? What do people owe their governments? That's a, that's a Civil War question. That's a Civil War and Reconstruction question. What's the proper relationship of the states to the federal government? State power to federal power. What does the Tenth Amendment really mean? These, these are issues, some of which we thought were buried in those Civil War National Cemeteries, but they're not. If you want to find the most visible, roiling legacies in our own current moment of of our Civil War, just look to state legislatures, especially the 35 or 36 controlled by the Republican Party. I'm not casting stones at one party here. It just happens to be a fact that in those state legislatures controlled by Republican parties, there are hundreds and hundreds of bills, some of which have passed, many of which have not passed, trying to bring power from the federal government, all kinds of power, back to the states or to eliminate the federal power altogether. Many of these laws have to do with the EPA, Environmental Protection. Many of them have to do with Interstate Commerce Clause. Many of them have to do with immigration. Many of them have to do with the uh, federal, new federal health care law known as Obamacare. Some of them are even as wacky as the one the state of Montana tried to pass. And I know I'm casting a stone at poor old Montana, but they actually voted on this. They had a bill that would have said, and it didn't pass, God bless them, it would have said that in order for the FBI to make an arrest inside the borders of Montana, they had to have the permission of a local sheriff. <laughs> now, you tell, how much American history do you not have to know to know what's wrong with that? <laughs> and with the recent, you know, terrorist and kidnappings, and everyone wants the FBI now to help them out. They're not bad at it, you know. Oy. Anyway, I'm leaving out the worst. But frankly, folks, if you want to see the roiling Civil War legacies in front of your eyes, just look up the websites of the Tea Party. Many of them invoke the Confederate Constitution. What they like about the Confederate Constitution is its resistance to centralized power. I didn't even know this because I don't look at their websites until I was writing an essay for a magazine called American Prospect in Washington, which is not a left-wing magazine. They asked me to write about Civil War legacies last summer. And I'm writing this piece and trying to come up, it was where I began to come up with this list. And the editor writes back to me, he said, have you looked at Tea Party websites? I said, no, I, I don't do that every morning. It's not my favorite thing to do. <laughs> he says, you gotta look because a lot of them cite the Confederate Constitution at length. They're really into it. So I did, and there they were. Now, to end, when Robert Penn Warren was trying to figure out how to end about the less aid in 1961, Legacy of the Civil War, I could sense he struggled, but he did what most of us do. He went to one of his favorite authors, and he quoted him, which is what I do. And he quoted Herman Melville. Warren's favorite writer was Herman Melville. He had several favorites, but he was a huge Melvillian. I think it's because of what they shared in their 
They loved the mode of tragedy, both of them. But he went to Melville's collection of poetry, Civil War poetry, which he published in 1866, just the year after the war. It's called Battle Pieces. And in a little supplement that Melville published to Battle Pieces in 1866, Melville said, quote, and notice only one year after the war, Melville said, let us pray that the terrible historic tragedy of our time may not have been enacted without instructing our whole beloved country through its pity and its terror. Now that's Melville's Aristotelian conception of tragedy. Tragedy is to be that horrible experience that you nevertheless somehow learn from. We're supposed to get instructed, you know, Greeks called it catharsis. Well, that's assuming you've survived that tragedy and so you can have your catharsis. But so then Warren takes that quote and he simply says, uh, 1961, have we been instructed by that catharsis of pity and terror in our own time at the centennial? And Robert Penn Warren's answer at that moment was, quote, sadly, we must answer no. We have not yet achieved justice. We have not yet created a union 